welcome everyone. Welcome to this latest episode of the Data Transformation Series out of the Digital Transformation Lab in University College Cork. And I was just talking to Susan. I'm absolutely delighted to have Susan with me today. Susan was referring to maybe uh, visits to here, Cork City in, in, in the past. Um, Susan, I know I've been following you for a, a good while. Uh, I, I also had the pleasure of, of reading your book, um, uh, which we, we will obviously. This book? And, and <laughs> Susan, the first time I saw it, I wasn't sure what category it should be in. So I'll show the audience again, actually, the yeah. title of it. So it's between the spreadsheets. So I was wondering, is that belong to the adult section or is that the data section or where does that belong? Why not put it everywhere? Get everybody reading about it. That's what yeah. I say. Yeah, and I think the subtitle is, is is actually spot on, classifying and fixing dirty data. And I know people do refer to, to you as the fixer of dirty data. Do you want to tell us a bit about yourself, Susan? Yeah, well, uh, I'm the self-proclaimed fixer of dirty data and the self-proclaimed classification guru. Um, my data journey started around 10, 10 and a half years ago when my first business, a uh, clothes shop here in Guildford, uh, sadly, I had to close and um, I was facing bankruptcy and I had no money and I needed a job desperately. And I found an ad online for some spend data classification with a spend analytics company. And I thought, well, I've worked for some big companies. I know what they're spending their money on. I could do that. Started there, found I loved it. I was really good at it, really fast at it and ended up spending five years with them growing a team, managing a team, managing all the projects, really loved it. Um, and when it was time to move on, because I hadn't come from a procurement or a data background, I didn't know even what my job title was or where I could get a job doing the same thing. So I was like, right, OK, I'm going to set up my own business again. And of course, everyone's like, are you sure about that? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. no, no, I, I, I can, I, you know, it's a real problem. You know, I can, I can tell, you know, people need this kind of help. Uh, and that was five and a half years ago um, that the Classification Guru was founded. And yeah, since then, I have been normalising suppliers, building customised spend taxonomies, classifying spend data, categorising marketing data, cleaning marketing data, merging marketing databases together, cleaning addresses of suppliers, um, and really just fixing those those data problems that other people haven't been able to solve. I mean, we love it here. I've got, I, you know, I've got a team of six now, about to be seven, and you know, we love problem solving. That's that's what we love to do. And actually, what you're saying reminded me of, of the earlier uh, uh, parts of the book, um, Susan, which uh, I th maybe it was the acknowledgement or maybe that first chapter, which was yeah. really a powerful human story of how you got to where you are now, Susan. You know, and um, you you could definitely feel the 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 human element in that in that story. Though the, the I think did you did you pass even a comment that at one stage you couldn't even afford to go bankrupt. Yeah, 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 that's true. Um, you have to pay around £600 to go bankrupt. So it took me about six months to save up enough money to to file for bankruptcy. And, you know, you have to go to court and sit in front of a judge, not in the courtroom, but just in his office. Um, and, you know, they sign it off. And um, it, it's really quite, you know, scary. You know, I've never been in trouble with the law before. So, you know, for, sitting in front of a judge was like, oh, I thought I was going to, you know, say, you know, you're irresponsible. What, what did you think you were doing? But, you know, they were absolutely fine about it. And um, if anyone's ever been in debt and had um, constant letters, threats of bailiffs coming to knock on your door, phone calls all the time, as soon as I got that bankruptcy signed off, that weight just lifted. Um, and, there, and I don't see any shame in it. You know, I tried something and it didn't work. Um, and it's, you know, made me a better person and it's got me to where I am today. So that's it exactly. And and you could and, and in fairness, you could even feel the passion for the first business, the business that didn't succeed, you know. But it you could a, also, yeah, yeah, you know. It was a great shop. It was beautiful, mm -hmm. but just didn't work out. Yeah, but obviously it then brought you to what you're really known for, you know, the classification guru. What is a classification guru on a Monday to Friday, um, Susan? <laughs> yeah, well, I guess owning your business, it's, it's Monday to Monday. Um, and I am living, breathing um, accuracy, data quality, 
getting your data to be the best it can be, not accepting, okay, oh, we know our data's wrong, but it'll do. That's not good enough in my world. Um, you know, you need to, to get your data clean and you need to keep it clean as well. You need to maintain it regularly and spot check. Uh, and that's often forgotten about as well. Uh, and in my world, I see a lot of clients, you know, going to software suppliers or third party suppliers for their spend analytics and they're doing this classification. And they have no idea if their data is right or wrong because they're so far detached from it that they they can't tell. So I give them tips on how to check, spot check their data, look for things that might not be right. But really, the more you look at your data, the more familiar you are with it, the easier it is to spot when things are wrong. You know, that's that's mm. the, you know, the the tip of the day, really. There's not a shortcut to that. You just you know, look at it regularly and you'll you'll see when things don't look right. That's right yeah. And I, I and thought that that was very powerful in the book, you know, this idea of nearly becoming intimate with your own data, you know, not allowing or uh, our, our believing that an algorithm or a piece of software can solve these problems for you. It can absolutely help. You have to have your data clean first. But even, you know, when reports and numbers are sent up to senior managers or the board, of a company or an organization. The people that are looking at these reports don't know if that data is right or wrong, if those numbers are right or wrong, because they get they get shown whatever they get shown from a department. And quite often, let's face it, I, I've seen this, the numbers can be manipulated. And if they are not close enough to their own numbers and data to know that, then things slip through the net, you know. So, yeah, it's really important for all of us, not just the people working with the data to know it. But, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying check, you know, if you're in, in a high senior level position, I'm not saying check it every day, but be familiar with it. Mm. And and it's a really interesting story as well, Susan, because um, we'd have had Scott Taylor, who I know you know uh, oh, well my and buddy, before. Yeah. yeah, the data whisperer. We had Tom Redmond, the data doc, and I both of them, and I distinctly remember both of them talking about how difficult it is to sell data quality uh, to senior executives in business. How How are you doing it? How do you do it? I discovered very early on that me reaching out to people telling them that I fixed data problems, I wasn't going to reach that many people. And it's very much, you know, it really depends if they've got an immediate problem at that time. So I started to, yeah, do make a lot of content for LinkedIn. And that's really where everything started to explode. Um, I let people come to me when they're ready. They see what I can do. And then when it's time, they'll approach me and say, oh, you know, are you able to help me with this? Um, but unfortunately, pretty much all the clients I work with are in a reactive phase. Mm. You know, there's mm. very few that will take a proactive approach to their data. It's very hard to tangibly, like physically show a benefit like, oh, we made X amount of savings. But the data contributes towards it. And, you know, I worked for a client and we improved their spreadsheets and merged a couple of them together with some formulas and saved them 10 hours a week between two people. Can you imagine how much that was cost in the business, how inefficient it must have been? And that's just two people in one department. Mm. Um, there, there are so many opportunities and I think it's it's really hard. And I often say if you're talking to like senior decision makers who are maybe not as close to the data, telling them that you can save time and money is not necessarily going to be an incentive for them. But telling them that having clean data and investing in it can help increase profitability, then that's something that might catch their attention. Uh, so fair. it's about talking to them in a different way, but still mm -hmm. trying to get the same results. That's interesting. So, uh, and I think you're right. It's 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 reactionary. It's nearly when something goes wrong. It's nearly the burning platform causes you know people to sometimes look at yeah, at and then quality. suddenly there's money available to to yeah. fix this, and it's like, well, it wasn't there last week? You know what happened? 
Yeah, and and I know, uh, and I'm fairly sure it's in the book as well, uh, Susan. You talk about you know these horror stories. Is that the data horror yeah. stories? That, and I particularly remember was at the Edinburgh Children's Hospital. Can you tell us a bit about one of those horror stories? You know, yeah. you know that is that I think that's one of the most popular chapters in the book. Actually, people love real life examples of stories um, because they can relate to them, and then they don't feel like they're the only people that are going through that kind of problem. But I mean, this was a 16 million pound mistake. So if you think that it's not going to affect your business like that, think again, it could. And it w- it came from a spreadsheet error. And, and, w- and it's basically the cause of it is just what we've talked about. People didn't know their data and know that something had gone wrong. Someone had taken some dimensions of a like a normal hospital room, like the aircon measurements or something, and literally copied and pasted that into the critical care room, which needed different specifications. And nobody picked up on it at all. And this went on for over the course of like I think over 12 years. Um and, and when it went out to tender, um one of the companies who bid for the project who didn't win actually corrected the mistake and still nobody picked up on it who was reviewing the bids and and so this this continued and continued and continued until it was built and then they realized once it was built that it wasn't functional bull it delayed the opening of the the hospital um it caused numerous numerous problems like really quite a simple spreadsheet error um caused 16 million pounds worth of damage and there was so much um what's the word i'm looking for um incompetency honestly um you know this did not just pass one or two people's eyes this went on over a number of years um, and i believe there's also another error in the spreadsheet that got picked up too it's it's terrifying um and you know it's public sector and i have worked in public sector and sometimes i feel like there's not that kind of ownership of or responsibility for money or projects um, because it's public sector, you know, it'll always get paid for. It's fine. You know, Mm. there's not the consequences that you might have in the business world for things like this. Mm. So I think we really have a bit of a mindset change to to work on as well in certain sectors. Yeah, and and like Susan, and I know there's going to be people listening to this, and and they'll be sort of saying to themselves, um, or maybe even they'll put in comments when this goes out, you know, that that's what happens when you use spreadsheets. But the issue here isn't really spreadsheets. They're still the 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 most uh, widely and prevalent way of, of processing data still in organisations is true spreadsheets. That's not just public sector; it's private sector. Yeah. Uh, and there's a snobbery, you know. I think I am going to. Call it a snobbery towards spreadsheets that yeah. we say, well, that's what happens when spreadsheets are there. But this is this is the tool of choice. It's it's a people problem. The data problems, uh, the majority of data problems are people problems, and it's that we are all just we just leave university and we start a job and we're all expected to know all this stuff. But actually, and and I think it's getting better, like for younger kids now. But certainly, like my my time I graduated like 20 years ago you just had to figure it out yourself you know there was no this is how you use my well Microsoft Office didn't exist back then um but there wasn't this is how you do this or that I mean a couple of years ago I was managing um a project over the summer and there were some students and I asked um one of them to set up a meeting with um, another colleague. And the next day I was like, oh, have you done that? She's like, no, no. I said, well, why not? She's like, I don't know how to. And there was that, well, first of all, she didn't ask. She didn't tell me that she didn't know. She would have just let it go. So we have to encourage people to to say, it's okay to say you don't know something, you know. Um, And and secondly, there, you know, that's probably something that we should be learning in school if not universities and colleges, um, just basic things like that. I mean, I this is showing my age now, but I did office and information studies mm-hmm. um, at school. I learned to touch type there. Um, and, you know, 
of course you'd expect it all to be full of girls but um you know we just we, we learn things like that and actually you know touch typing has been like prevalent through all my life you know it's one of the key skills I have and and that's kind of missing and, and that's why I wrote the book as well because there are a lot of people that are afraid to put their hand up and say actually I don't know this mm-hmm. and, I, and I learned this doing training courses I was talking people through um, some VLOOKUPs and, and people were saying on in the chat oh, oh what's a VLOOKUP and I thought oh wow you know I really overestimated um how much people know so now I assume that people their base knowledge is nothing and work from that yeah and and that's at all levels of, of organizations yeah. Susan like you know I think sometimes now we're we're besotted with you know machine learning AI uh, and we, we're giving out that the algorithms may not do what the algorithms should do but the big part of the issue is actually the human part like you call out that we have people that still aren't comfortable with data uh, uh, and we also have people that are uncomfortable putting their hand up when the data t- says x y and, and z What's yeah. your view on this whole data literacy thing and, and what sort of skills you, you've been hiring in this space, in this data profession space, what sort of skills are we missing, do you think? Uh, for me, so I think there's two parts. There's data literacy within the data world and then there's data literacy within the rest of the, the business world. Um, and it's different things for each part. So within data, um, I very much recruit for my team based on attitude rather than skill. Um, so it's very much um, I'm looking for people who who can like if they don't know something, they're just going to figure out the answer. And if they can't, then they'll come and ask um, rather than than people who are waiting to be spoon fed that information. I, I need people with curiosity and that drive and hunger to learn more and be better. So that's what I'm looking for. Um, and actually, um, you, well, you may or may not believe it, but actually all of my team, pretty much apart from me, are are serious introverts. You know, they are like getting their camera on, on Zoom is like, is hard work. They are not um, the kind of people that um, would would sit and come and do this kind of thing, um, and that's fine. And and I don't, you know, I don't publicly like share pictures of them because that's they don't want that kind of publicity, and that's absolutely fine. Um, I think in the data space, um, definitely there are a lot of, of introverted um, people who just want to get their head down and do their work. And then on the business side, we need to talk about data, data literacy, data governance in in a relatable way that's less intimidating. Because if you get the tech hardcore people talking to the business people in the tech language, they shut down, they they get scared, they switch off, they don't understand, so they're not going to listen anymore. Um, uh, and, you know, that's that's why I called the book Between the Spreadsheets. You know, I'm trying to bring some fun and excitement to what is, can be a very boring area um, and trying to make everybody think about it in a different way. But it's it's not a one size fits all for everybody. Definitely. No. And um, and I, I recall uh, Christina Finley, you know, um, who works with Nest also, you know, talking about that we need to realise a lot of people in the data profession are introverts and, and they you know, work in, 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 a, in a different way or we need to work with them in a different yeah. way, you know, and I think that's a point really well made by yourself as well. Um, you talk about giving your data a coat. And and yeah. I, and I've heard you say that a number of cases. It's also in the book. What do you mean, uh, Susan? Giving your data a coat? Again, it's down to this: getting everybody, regardless of what position you work in in an organisation, to start thinking about data in the same way. And um, having your data coat on. So first of all, consistency in your data. So that is um, things like measurements, meters or inches. Um, is it um, miles or kilometers? Things like that. How do we do it with US, UK spellings, European spellings? Like, are we all doing it the same way? 
Um, then it can be things like date formats. And I and I love doing this in online um, presentations because I get everybody in the group to write how they format their date in the chat and you just get a list of all these different date formats, either day, month, year, month, day, year. Um, they could use dashes, slashes, dots, no spaces at all to separate. Um, you, you get everything. And these are people who either work together or in, in the same organisation. Um, it's really powerful. So just getting everybody to work in the same way is, is half the battle and will solve half your problems. Then O is for organised data. So, you know, in, in the procurement space, you have to classify into buckets of, you know, IT, HR, professional services, travel, but it could be you are classifying your data into business units or departments, divisions, regions, countries. And what it really means is if you've got it all categorised and ready to go, when someone says to you, oh, what did we sell in the US last week? If your data is all nice and organised, you can just pull it out as if you had organised your wardrobe nicely. You know, just put your put your uh, clothing in there by style, by colour, you know, just pull it out and get what you need. Um, so it's it's about that. And then, of course, accurate data. And I think, again, it's changing that um, mindset of it'll do or it's good enough. Get it as accurate as you can. And once you have your consistency, your organisation and your accuracy, you've got then trustworthy data. And that's one of the biggest things that I constantly hear is, we don't trust our data yeah. all the time. So, you know, it's not 100% foolproof, but it will absolutely help you get there um, a lot easier. And, you know, it's about getting the non-data people involved too, because we are we all work with data. We're not all data people. And the people who input data that are not data people are just as important as the data people, because that's where a lot of the problems start. So if they're thinking about their data coat, um, that's a good way to get them involved. Yeah, and the book is is uh, very useful in terms of nearly stepping people through a methodology, you know, for how you would uh, uh, do that. And I think it's powerful. I think the book also refers to the, you know, um, I suppose the uh, the uh, introduction of GDPR within uh, Europe. Uh, and yeah. I was intrigued um, by your view on to what extent has that changed what you're doing or you need to do or what companies need to do when it comes to data, uh, Susan? I think what surprised me about GDPR was, um, for me, it was always, oh, you have to keep it secure and safe and, and make sure nobody steals it. Um, but actually, just as important is you have to have accurate data. So if you are storing people's information, um, first of all, you should only be sure to store the information you need, you know, if you only need a name and address and an email, that's all you should collect. You know, don't bother with inside leg measurements and hair colour and whatever. Just collect what you need. But it also has to be accurate. So make sure you haven't misspelled that person's name or got their address wrong, because actually you're in breach of GDPR just by having that. So, I mean, the reality is we're probably all in breach of GDPR to some extent because we've probably all got something that's not quite right. But it's um, it's really important, that accuracy piece. So when people are collecting information, if it's within your organisation, get them all to put the coat on and have that consistency. You know, is it uppercase, lowercase? Are we abbreviating street, place, drive and the address or not? Um, you know, how are we formatting the phone numbers? Um, just getting all those things right will help you comply with GDPR. And then there's all the training around the security, not sharing that information, not using it for purposes that it's not meant for. Um, but but even as a small business, I mean, it terrifies me um, that one day they'll come knocking on my door and, mm -hmm. and be like, oh, you know, you're not doing it properly. Um, but I think sometimes I'm more worried than the large organisations, which is also terrifying. It is, yeah, and that's an interesting comment even. And, and it, it was probably going to lead, or it's related to the question I was going to ask, Susan, I uh, don't know, when people call you, call your company, is it more likely because they want to remain compliant, uh, so the regulation, or is it that something has really gone wrong already? 
No, it's it's hit the fan, as they say. Yeah. Um, it's gone terribly wrong. They need to fix it quickly. Um, please help. That's that's what happens. And is it that there's a low awareness of GDPR, or is it that um, uh, companies just don't really care? They, they assume if there's issues, it'll be a larger company or a companies in th- a different sector will, will be hit with the penalties. Honestly, I think even GDPR experts don't really fully understand GDPR, um, if that's the honest truth. And and so that's probably not at the top of their list of things. It's We've got a problem and we need to fix it. That's probably what they're thinking. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is. I think it's probably similar here, I, I would think. Uh, yeah, do, um, actually, I'll give you an example. When GDPR was about to happen, I started doing some posts around get your data ready for GDPR. Nobody, nobody messaged me. And it wasn't until about nine months later, I got an influx of requests when things started to pop up in the news about this, that and the next thing. Um, again, all reactive. Yeah, yeah. And and would it be things in the news about what happened to companies that got had data issues or would it be news uh, about companies getting fined because of GDPR? I think, yeah, they get fined and then people just see that and it doesn't yeah. really matter who the company is or what they've done. I mean, I've seen like H&M, H&M got a huge fine for how they videoed staff or people in changing rooms or something. They were They weren't using that data properly and we don't always think about that as data um so people kind of yeah maybe thought about it in a different way yeah yeah and like you you have a very interesting model is it is it the dirty data maturity model for giving (laughs) organizations a sense of of where they are in terms of uh, the quality of their data can you tell us a little bit about that yeah, again, it it's about appealing to people that are non-data people. And I don't know if you've seen all the fancy consultancy maturity models with the big grids and their fancy words, uh, which mean nothing really. You know, I, I, I wanted something where literally there's an image, uh, if I can find it. And... It's very small, but basically you could go to your mm. someone in your organization and say, we're here and we need to be here. And it starts with a heap of clothes in a pile on the floor. Um, and then it, it goes to D-class data, then to distributed data, to disordered data, to dirt-free data, the pinnacle. And I just take people through the steps of what that might look like in their organizations. But it's... For me, it really is about communicating it in a in a non-threatening, um, interesting way that will will trigger something in people's minds that they'll remember it. You know, they might not remember all of it, but they'll remember something. Mm-hmm. And what's the, the the health check on it, um, Susan? When you look back at the companies you've been working on, uh, with, uh, or you know, other companies. Uh, does it tend to vary by industry as to how good or bad things are, or is it uh, really uh, all companies are are struggling to some extent in this space? Oh, honestly, every single company has some level of data issues somewhere, whether it's their database, whether it's their spend data, whether it's their marketing data, somewhere there's a problem. Um, And I think also they don't know where to go to for help. I think often they're missold a lot of tools or services that claim to help, but they don't. And again, that's down to data literacy. They are kind of um, sold, you know, oh, our, our neural networks and the algorithm will fix all this for you, you know, and and it's not the case at all. Um, and so again, there's a piece around, yeah, that data literacy. Yeah. Technology is not a silver bullet when it comes to data quality. No, really. and it's, you know, even within like spend data, um, classifying spend data is very subjective. A lot of context is involved, but there are areas where AI really works. So, for example, machine parts, so nuts, bolts, screws, you can automate the hell out of that because a screw is a screw. That's fine. 
But when you have something, a description like taxi from restaurant to hotel, you need context um, to be able to understand what's going on there. And sometimes you'll you'll um, see references to things that are are not actually relevant. So when I'm doing my speaking sessions, one of that one of the examples I always highlight is LinkedIn. The description said restaurant. So somebody classified it LinkedIn as a restaurant, but we all know LinkedIn is not a restaurant. It's a social media recruitment training platform. Um, so that's where, you know, having context really is important. Mm -hmm. and, so it's, it's used being smart about it, really, and knowing yeah. what works and what doesn't. Yeah, and, and you, you also have a phrase, though, that you should be as accurate as possible. Um, yeah. How how do we know how accurate uh, we need to be, um, and how accurate we we should be? You know, even from a, a regulation etc. point of view. I'd say, like when it comes to numbers, finance, you have to be one hundred percent accurate because the regulator will come after you. But if it's a uh, collecting of information for a database, it could be getting their first name, last name, their job title, and their email. That could be accurate. And, and so each type of data will have different requirements. So if you're filling in product information in an ERP and you need to put in the dimensions, you know, they have to be right. I've heard stories of like a TV being put into the system as one centimetre by one centimetre. So then the, you know, truck loading software thinks, oh, we can get hundreds of TVs on this truck and actually, or thousands, and actually, no, you can't because the dimensions are wrong. Um, so it's, yeah. Big issues, yeah. It and depends is the answer. There's the, like very much within the space, it's not black and white and there's, there's more than one right answer depending on what type of data you're working with. Yeah, and and so let's say there is an issue in a company and they, they're picking up the phone, they, they need it resolved. What's a typical engagement like uh, from your side, Susan? Where do you start? What do you do? Um, uh, what are the stages or steps or, or, or what happens? Well, first of all, I'd say there is no such thing as a typical engagement. Every project genuinely is is massively different. Um, but the most important thing is, uh, and this is always the first conversation we have, is I say, tell me your problems. So rather than tell people how I can fix their, their data, I want to find out what their problems are first, because quite often they come to me with what they think is a problem, but actually the problem is something else. So by getting them just to offload and tell me all the problems and what they're facing, I can then get a better idea of um, what is needed to be done to fix it. And the most common kind of problems are things like we have multiple systems, we don't have all the data in one place, we don't have any visibility, um, it's not categorised correctly, it's not this, it's not that. Um, those are the kinds of of things um, that we are we're dealing with are you know in multiple um, suppliers set up on the system because the addresses are slightly different or you know they've been bought by another company over the years and they've got an old version on their system, so there's a lot of lot of things like that that go on. Mm -hmm. And Kamir, what's really exciting you about the industry? So you, you've been in the industry now for for a while. Uh, what do you see as emerging or maybe there's trends or there's something happening that really excites you about the future of, of, of the industry? It's, it's amazing how much it's changed in the last five and a half years. When I started out, dirty data was a secret. It was not talked about. And people are talking openly about data quality issues now. There are lots of tools and software out there. It's... Honestly, I thought that my business would kind of peak and plateau over time and that my services wouldn't be needed after a while because technology would take over. And actually, the opposite has happened. More and more people are looking at data. They're finding more and more problems with it. There's more things that need to be fixed and it can't all be done by software. So um, we're using way more data than we were even five and a half years ago. I think... We need to know our own data more. I think 
AI is it's still going to lead the way, but I think people need to kind of just be a bit more aware of what its capabilities are, depending on what type of data you're working with. Um, we're hearing a lot more around data engineering now. I think that's the next kind of up and coming um, area for careers, possibly. However, I also know um, I attend lots of data events that you can have two people doing the same job in different organisations and their job titles are completely different. You wouldn't even know they did the same thing. So I would also um, say to anyone watching, actually, don't don't judge anything based on on the job title. Look at look at the skills. Um, and there are lots of opportunities and um, there have been a lot of um, job cuts, unfortunately, in the tech industry recently. However, there are tech is growing, there are still going to be an awful lot of opportunities in this space. Um, just niche down on, rather than be a generalist, niche down on something. That really worked for me. When I when I first started out, I tried to be everything to everyone and nobody really knew what I did. So that's where the tagline fixer of dirty deeds mm. came from. It was really easy to explain to people what I did. Um, so, yeah, I think we'll get more specialists in areas as well. Yeah, so that's a nice summary. So dirty data is no longer maybe as much of a secret and it shouldn't be as much yeah. of a secret. Yeah, and I really Every, like, like... Everybody has it. It's, yeah, that's right, yeah. yeah. Don't be ashamed of it. It's there, but it's yeah. to address it. Don't don't hide it in the cupboard. We need to, uh, I suppose... Well, we could um, really, yeah, we could learn from each other Yeah. by sharing. Yeah. Yeah, and something that seems to be uh, very, uh, I, I've heard you sort of say it and I've heard, uh, I've read you say it a lot about, and you've even said it earlier in this uh, interview that, you know, these are, are skills, they're no long, they're not necessarily skills that come from having PhDs or masters or whatever. It's nearly more an attitude than anything and that we can mm. bring people into this industry, Susan, though, that have the right attitude, the right uh, attention to detail. And that doesn't necessarily come from big, big titles big roles, big qualifications. Uh, my, my coach will tell you, I have a coach, um, that for a long time I didn't think I was a data person because I have no qualifications. Um, I did not come from a data background. Um, I worked in the procurement space and I did not consider myself to be a data person because I didn't have a maths degree or a computing degree or anything like that. And and she just said to me, do you work with data? And I said, yes. She's like, then you're a data person. And she has been laughing this year because I've won an award for data champion of the year. And she's like, funny that a, not a data person winning a data award. So it's, yeah, it, you know, I am terrible with maths and numbers. And, and I always assumed that you had to be good at those things to work in data. And it's absolutely not the case at all. There's there's a role for everybody in data. Powerful. And like if, and I know this is a really corny thing to say, and I don't normally say it, but like if you're to give advice, not necessarily to the younger you, but to younger people that are maybe considering a, a career in an industry where we do need new people come in, what advice would you be giving them, um, uh, Susan? Do something that you love. Like, don't, you know, I failed my higher maths and and I d only did it. I knew I would fail, but I only did it because my dad said, everybody wants a maths qualification, you know, blah, 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 blah. Um, do something that you find what you love and do that because and focus in. Actually, a lot of us spend time trying and I did this with my maths. I tried to focus so hard on improving the areas I wasn't good at and what I should have been doing was improving the areas that I was, you know, working on the areas that I am good at. Um, so I've I've learned that over the years and that's been really powerful. That's definitely got me to where I am now, um, knowing what I can do and what I can. And, you know, even in the business, you know, I've got an accountant, you know, they can deal with the numbers. I don't want to deal with the numbers. I'll get it wrong. I don't want to end up owing the tax man lots of money. Um, so, yeah, focus in on what you really love and enjoy and and focus in on what you're good at. Don't worry about what you're not good at. Mm. Get better at the things you're good at because it will mm. be much easier. Yeah, and we do need more people in the data industry. I like I I, I, uh, I laugh 
uh, uh, I suppose when I see you online because you do some really interesting um, uh, releases on social media in particular. Yeah. I see you rubbing shoulders with a lot of people in the data industry. Yeah. Uh, who who do you really look up to in this industry? You know, who, who do you respect? Who, who would you suggest are the people we really need to be listening to in this industry? Oh, my goodness. Well, I mean, uh, I know he's been on and spoken to you already, but Scott Taylor is, you know, the the man who is also trying to work in a space that's to, you know trying to translate to the business um Kate Strachney is doing some amazing things her new color books just come out which looks amazing I've, I've read it it's fascinating just using color for analytics and yeah. um the the impact that using the right colors versus the wrong colors or the wrong style of chart can can leave on you um George Furrican in the data governance space, he's my buddy too. He does a lot of good work, um, very knowledgeable, as is Nicola Ascom. And yeah, it's it's there are so many there are, yeah. people. It's you kind of stick to your own tribe, yeah, really. That's you know, a people nice that list. you're drawn towards. Yeah. yeah. But there, I mean, there are many others. But you know, I also get that I can I'm not your classic data person and I'm not everybody's cup of tea and I'm okay with that as well. And I think that's part of your message. And and I referred earlier to you know that those first chapters in your book, you know, the acknowledgements, the I think the introduction section as well. And that was very much, you know, a part of your your story, you know, that yeah. you are who you are and you're you know now where your strengths lie. Yeah. You are a data professional. You are um uh, I suppose um, someone that's looked up to in the industry. Um Susan, it's been fantastic. Tony, is there anything I should have asked you, I didn't ask you, that or something that you'd like to, to uh, as a parting shot? Um, I guess my my secret sauce, secret tip that's not so secret is is data maintenance, and that that really is the secret to making your life a lot easier. Is don't just fix it, maintain it as well. That's the only thing I would I would say is you know I would emphasize along with the data coat because you know that helps you remember the maintenance because it's not good enough to put your coat on you have to keep it on as well so mm, that's interesting and uh, and i knew i was supposed to be finishing this but i'm going to ask you another question <laughs> what's your view on master data management which is some would say it's very much technology driven it's about that single view of customers etc but i i i notice it's not necessarily a, um, a phrase you use much at least i i can't recall you using that phrase no Oh, I, and, and in the procurement space, and most of my clients are in the kind of procurement side, um, they have supplier masters. However, their supplier masters are completely different to, say, the business master. And it it's a tricky one. And um, we also clean material master data as well. And I've seen some really messy stuff in there. Um, I think it's. Again, it's get the coat on, make it consistent, organised, accurate, trustworthy, but also understand that it might not all fit into one neat little package. Mm. That's it, yeah, yeah. And because the then what happens is, sorry to cut you off there, but if you do try and fit everything into this master list, you're going to end up with incorrect data, dirty data, because you tried to make it fit rather than having something that was, you know, fit for purpose. And and what I say, particularly on the procurement side is, have this procurement master list, but do a mapping to the company master list so that you can, everyone's happy that way. Mm -hmm. Great advice. Uh, for those that are listening and watching, uh, I can see there's a giant um, cardboard uh, cutout of Robbie Williams behind yes. Sus Susan yes. here. Do you want, people are going to be intrigued as to uh, what your, uh, cardboard cutout is doing standing next to Robbie Williams uh, yeah. which is behind you. Do you want to tell us that story, Susan, just to put people out of their curiosity, misery? Yeah. I do find I have to explain on on introductionary calls as well. Oh, by the way, this is um, so I'm a huge Robbie Williams fan, seen him so many times. I've lost count. 
Um, one year, my dad got me the life-size cardboard cutout, which was great. And then last year, I got 3D Susan made for an event that was cancelled. So she has been in the house with Robbie ever since. Um, and now they're a feature in my in my uh, background. Um, I find that it's a really great conversation starter, kind of breaks the kind of awkwardness of meeting someone for the first time um and again it's we can have fun and be professional at the same time they're not mutually exclusive yeah and um it's great to see um uh cut, cut out uh susan cohabiting with uh cut out robbie and both are wearing their their santa hats and oh yeah they're the very background. festive right now <laughs> yeah susan thank you so much it's, it's been a really really fascinating uh discussion and it's uh, it, it's also uh, i would recommend to anyone that's listening to have a look at the book um uh, i i read it over the last few weeks um between the spreadsheets uh, uh by susan walsh highly recommend where else can people find um, uh, and follow what you're talking about, Susan. The book is available on Facet's web, Facet Publishing's website. It's on, in the UK, it's like Waterstones, W. H. Smith's, um, obviously Amazon, um, across the world too. American Library Association distributes it in the US for us. Um, but if you really want to, to keep uh, up to date with 3D Susan's antics and, and everything else I'm up to, you can follow me on LinkedIn. Uh, Susan Walsh, a classification guru, uh, and that's where you'll get most of your content. Fantastic. Thank you, Susan. Thank you so much for having me.